today on Inside the Issues, Louise Frechette on the UN and global governance. Welcome to a special edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Uh, special because we're in front of a live audience today, a symposium of the senior CG Junior Fellows here in Waterloo, Ontario at the Center for International Governance Innovation. I'm David Welch. I'm the uh, Balsillie Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs. And I'm pleased to welcome today Madame Louise Frechette, a distinguished Canadian, a distinguished Canadian diplomat, and a very distinguished uh, practitioner of international global governance. And we're going to chat today about your role, your thoughts, your experiences, your recommendations, and your vision of the future of international global governance. Uh, so let's start just by giving our audience a, a bit of a background on you. You had a, an interesting sort of trajectory into the international global governance system. Well, um, I guess um, this was an unplanned career. If there's one way I should describe uh, my, my uh, my professional choices, I really became a diplomat by accident. I didn't know I was applying to become a diplomat. They were just advertising jobs abroad, and I thought, why not? Wrote the exam, and it's only when I started that I realized I was a diplomat in training. And then I had, a, you know, the standard uh, series of assignment in Ottawa abroad, nothing very exciting until, I'd say, a good 15 years into my career where things started to take a different shape where I, I uh, was given more visible responsibilities and so on, always within foreign affairs until, um, until I was uh, posted to the UN in 1992 um, as permanent representative ambassador uh, by Prime Minister Mulroney. And this had in this, and that was a determinant moment in my in my career in my life because if I had not been ambassador to the UN in 1992, 93, 94, um, Kofi Annan would not have come to me in 1998 asking uh, him to, to asking me to join him as his number two in a new job he had just created as part of his first wave of UN reform. Between my time in New York as deputy, uh, as uh, a permanent representative of Canada, and my return to New York in 1998 to the UN Secretariat, I was briefly an associate deputy minister in the Department of Finance, and I was the deputy minister of national defense for three years, which means I have an unusual background in the sense that I've done foreign affairs, finance, and defense, which right. is uh, quite a combination. Which means that I know a little bit about a lot of things. Right. I won't ask you whether you like uh, New York or Ottawa better, but uh, Kofi Annan created this position, yeah. uh, Deputy Secretary General. Uh, tell us a bit about why he did that. What's the backstory to that? <laughs> well, you have position? to remember that Kofi Annan was the first Secretary General to come from inside the House, and therefore he knew the Secretariat of the UN very well. And he knew what the job of Secretary General entailed very well, perhaps more better than all his predecessors who'd come from either the diplomatic service of their countries or their been ministers. Um, he knew how big a job it is to be Secretary General of the UN, and he felt that um, he would benefit from the support of someone who would be close to him um, in his office, in addition to the, the staff officers who usually so don't support the Secretary General, but he wanted a post where there'd be enough visibility to carry some of his burden. Um, but it's a post that didn't have any authority, no statutory authority whatsoever. Uh, it was a post that was defined as a supporting uh, function to the Secretary General it's himself. And when I arrived, frankly, there were only a few general thoughts about what this new person would do. Uh, and it was clearly designed to provide backup to the Secretary General on issues where he had less time himself to, to uh, be involved personally. Secretary General sp spends most of his time on peace and security issues. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's on conflict prevention uh, 24 hours a day. Um, he's in direct relation with the Security Council and its members constantly. And it leaves little time for him to worry about 
development issues and environmental issues. Uh, so that part of the job was written in, if you want. And so was the notion that the Deputy Secretary General would uh, support and oversee reform. For the rest, we made it up as we went. And it ended up being a job uh, with a very uh, important uh, coordination dimension, as well as a kind of troubleshooting dimension. When things w really went off the rail, he turned to me and say, fix it. Right. Now, I, this is a hard question for you to answer, but do you think his asking you to take this post for the first time was a compliment to Canada or a compliment to you because he knew you personally or some combination of the two um, or something else? He had uh, decided that since he was a man from the south, he was going to turn uh, to the north and he wanted a woman as his deputy. Uh, after that, uh, I think it was a, um, a personal uh, choice. Uh, there were other uh, senior women he had, uh, he had on his list. Uh, in the end, he offered it to me. Um, I think the fact that I was Canadian was, was uh, no, it's not a bad calling card, but that's not the reason. And I was not a candidate of Canada. In fact, I'm the one who told the government I'm leaving to go to the UN. They didn't know. Uh, right, so, uh, so it was really, and that's the way, in fact, staff of the UN Secretariat ought to be appointed. You're not supposed to be there as representing your home government. You are supposed to be there in your own right as an international person whose, uh, whose total commitment is to the organization. So in a sense, my nomination was very much in the spirit of what senior civil servants or any civil servant of the UN Secretariat should, uh, should be like. And what was your sense when you stepped into the role of the state of play in international global governance? Was it, did, did, were you daunted by the prospect of this messy, challenging, complex, ill-defined task you were being given? or? Or did you see it as a real opportunity here? Well, to, to tell here? you the truth, um, I had just spent three hellish years <laughs> as Deputy Minister of National Defense in the middle of the worst crisis of, uh, of the history, almost, of the, of the institution. You had the Somalia scandal. You had deep budget cuts. So compared to that, the challenge in the UN didn't seem that daunting, to tell you the truth. But in reality, I knew the UN very well because I'd spent three years as permanent representative uh, of, of Canada at a time where things were, in fact, quite positive. 92, 93, it was very exciting to be in New York. So um, uh, I, I wasn't too concerned about uh, the, the state of governance. Uh, Already Kofi Annan had emerged as a popular secretary general. It wasn't necessarily the case when he was elected because he was elected in complicated circumstances where the Americans decided that they did not want to give Kofi Annan's predecessor, Boutros Ghali, a second term. So there was a bit of bad blood around the, the, the member states uh, that there was you know, uh, uh, a new secretary general because the Americans had said no to the tradition of two-term Secretary General. But by the time I arrived, a year after Kofi's election, the mood was in fact quite good and Kofi was emerging as a major popular Secretary General uh, with, uh, with a, f a popular following uh, that was quite unusual. So it was a very exciting time. And of course, I knew many of his close advisors because I'd known them when I was, a, when I was ambassador. So uh, it was not too difficult um, uh, for me to make my way in. The challenge was to design the job and to make sure that all the, the senior levels in the secretariat uh, um, uh, accepted to deal with a new player at the top. And that required some uh, careful, careful uh, uh, establishment of good working relationships with all the, the senior managers of the system to reassure them that I wasn't coming in to, to be another boss, that I was coming in really to make their life easier, to help them solve their problems, and to make the, the place work better. A good combination of challenge and opportunity. Yes. We'll be back with uh, Louise Frechette in just a moment. 
You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. You can find us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. We're talking with uh, Louise Frechette, former Assistant Secretary General of the UN and a distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Uh, you came into the uh, UN position, Deputy Secretary General, at a time of reform. What was your sense of what was broken and needed fixing? And what was your sense of what was working and didn't need fixing? Well, um, there are a lot of things that need fixing that cannot be fixed by the Secretary General. The Security Council being a good example of something that needs fixing, that needs reform, but on which the Secretary General has very little uh, influence. On the other hand, it was clear that there was plenty of room for improvement in the management and coordination of the, of the UN system. Uh, that there was plenty of room for improvement in the way the UN uh, carried out peacekeeping in particular. Um, of course, at the end of, of the day, the member states' support for some of these reforms was essential, if only because they had budgetary implication and you had to go to the member states with proposals. Uh, but our focus was very much on the machinery of the UN, making the machinery work better. It doesn't mean that the member states will decide to use the machinery in the way that you or I would like, but at least in terms of making the, the, the machinery of the UN more responsive, more coherent, better coordinated, there was plenty of space. And that's really the kinds of reforms that we pursued throughout the, uh, the eight years that I was there. Now, some people say that the, the UN has a a very ironic history because it hasn't been especially successful at doing what it was set out to do, which was collective security. It's only had two opportunities really to do that. But it's been, some people would say, very successful in doing what it wasn't originally designed to do, including all the functional agencies, um, the peacekeeping, and now the peace building. Uh, what's your sense of the real strength of the UN as an organization today, as a contribution to global governance, and what's your sense of its main weakness? Well, Professor, I'm sorry to disagree with you. <laughs> I'm happy to have you disagree with me. Uh, because I think it, uh, uh, the UN has been more successful than we recognize in, in areas of collective security. If you don't define security, collective security, only in relation to kind of st strategic threats to global peace, uh, I think the UN interprets its, uh, its uh, mission in relation to peace and security uh, in, uh, in broader terms than that, uh, in terms of uh, con no prevention of uh, regional conflicts, in terms of nowadays intervention in internal conflicts. And in, in that respect, the UN has as long a list of successful interventions as there is a long list of situations where it wasn't successful. We could spend time looking at why it was successful or not successful. Uh, but um, I think it has been more important than is often recognized in the fact that over the last 60 years, we have not had a return to, to world war, that a lot of, of local conflicts have been brought to some form of, of conclusion. If you look at the experience of the UN in, um, at the end of the Cold War, the, the Cold War period was of course one where there were big limits to what the UN could do in peace and security. But since the end of the Cold War, many, many countries have, with the help of the UN, uh, come out of long conflicts. They've had support in rebuilding peace. And nowadays, you go to Mozambique, you go to Angola, you go to Sierra Leone. You, the UN's intervention of a peace and security nature has made a difference for the good. So, um, but that is a role it invented as it went along. That wasn't part of the founding charter. Well, which may be a good sign, right? That means the institution has some flexibility, some capacity to adapt to changing circumstances. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think the, when you go back to the UN Charter, you realize. Uh, that it was a very wise document and that 
uh, to the extent that even some of the premises of the Charter uh, go well beyond the notion that the UN exists to stop major conflicts between big powers, <laughs> uh, but it exists uh, to promote uh, human rights, to, uh, uh, to support uh, people in their search for better living and for, for, uh, for equity. Um, in fact, uh, everything that the UN does today is in application of the spirit of the of the char charter, it's it's clear that the, the the founders of the charter could not imagine in 1946 how their concept would evolve and would be applied. Uh, but in a sense, how the UN has evolved is not in contradiction with the the original vision. It is uh, uh, it is in in fulfillment in much in in much more complex terms than was. Uh, that was envisaged at the beginning of a vision of the founders, which uh, which saw the need for some kind of central reference point in terms of of the norms, and the charter remains the normative reference f for inter interstate relation and the use of force, uh, and for collective efforts to make life on this planet more just and more. Uh, uh, more uh, more uh, satisfying for for the people of the world. And what would you say its biggest disappointments have been, or its biggest weakness? What could use the most work now? <laughs> um, I'm not too worried about the machinery. I think the machinery can be improved uh, uh, further, quite a bit further. Um, but the problem is not the machinery, in my opinion. The problem is um, is the the vision that the member states have of what kind of world order they want, and therefore how they want to use this tool. The UN is a tool um, uh, in support of their common vision. In a sense, what we've gone through over the last 20 years is an exception rather than the rule in, in interstate relations, if, if I may put it this way. When I arrived at the UN as ambassador in 1992, it was quite extraordinary to see a kind of real convergence to work around similar vision of what, what the, uh, the world should be like. There was tremendous energy behind the notion of democracy and behind the notion of human rights. Um, and it allowed all kinds of things to happen. The reason why the UN became more interventionist in defense of, of, uh, of, the, of human rights, the protection of civilians, the, the whole notion of the norm of responsibility to protect was unthinkable during the Cold War. That became, uh, that became conceivable. Um, the apparatus around human rights in the UN evolved very significantly at the end of the Cold War. But that's because you really had a dominant ideology that uh, was strong enough to rally the majority of member states. It doesn't mean that all member states were equally comfortable with it, but it meant that for one reason or the other, either they were too weak, Russia, or too preoccupied with their, their own internal challenges, like China, uh, to uh, really challenge this vision that was led very strongly by the Americans. Uh, 20 years later, we are at a new moment where, to me, the key question is what does the international community, what do the member states of the UN, what do the new powers want out of the UN? What is the vision that they carry? Are they still committed to um, the vision of the Charter, a multilateral system? How far are they uh, prepared to go in terms of the, uh, of the human security agenda, putting the security of individuals ahead of the security of state? That has been a very powerful concept for over the last 15, 20 years. Is this where China, India, the other uh, coming powers want to, to, uh, to take the, the international governance system? That's the big question. The for that instrument. matter, is that where Canada wants to take it? Well, we I think it's the forefront a, of that. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a very good question. Now, there's also the lessons that have been learned of the last 20 years. And I think some of the lessons learned of the, of the last 20 years is that uh, it's not enough to have a, 
an invigorating vision of the world that you want, uh, that some challenges are extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to meet. That the use of um, military force, for instance, in order to force respect for human rights, to force protection of civilians, to stop conflict, in fact, is fraught. We've tried many times to realize that it's not, it's, it's not good enough. And we're not quite sure how to do it. Um, so there, I think there's been some, some, uh, some lessons learned that may make the international community more cautious in the future because there's no obvious recipe that will guarantee that if you deploy 5,000 troops or 10,000 troops, you can stop massacre and things will fall into place. Uh, in that sense, the example of Rwanda or Kosovo are perhaps uh, too simple. I agree with General Dallaire when he said, if they sent 5,000 well-armed troops, we could have stopped this genocide. I think he's right. But I'm not sure that s similar situations will all lend themselves to that kind of, of easy intervention. Same thing for Kosovo. Kosovo bombing from the air did the job. I'm not sure that the same would have happened in Darfur. Very hard to know. So there are lessons learned which make the, the international community a little more careful. But I think there's also a question, a more fundamental question of where do the new powers want to take the world? Exactly. Well, we'll be right back in a minute with uh, Madame Louise Frechette. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. You can find us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, Louise, some people would say that the world has changed in at least three really important ways in recent decades. One is that conflict, as you mentioned before, has shifted from interstate to interstate. It's gone internal. Second is that global inequality continues to rise. And the third is that there are more players on the global stage now than there used to be, and in particular, non-state actors are more and more important. So I don't think anybody, very few people anyway, would say that the world would be better off without the UN. But how does the UN adapt to a world in which there are these three trends when it was designed to govern a world of states, by states, in which the big problem at the time really was interstate conflict? Well, actually, when you look through the uh, Cold War period, there were plenty of internal conflicts that made lots of victims. But at the time, the, the, uh, the, the principle that, uh, that prevailed was that of non-intervention. So in my book, the UN has progressed quite well from the time where it was hands-off vis-a-vis internal conflict. I mean, you did have a genocide in Cambodia, and you did have a really bloody civil war in Nigeria. Uh, these issues never appeared on the Security Council's agenda. Now they do. So there has been an evolution in the UN, and I think that if you look at the last 20 years, the real challenge has been to learn how to deal with these situations. And as I said uh, a minute ago, uh, we've, we've had some, some not very pleasant experiences with how to deal with, with these issues where, uh, where we've discovered that it's not because we deployed 20,000 troops or 30,000 troops in Bosnia that we managed to, uh, uh, to stop the fighting. But we've also learned that timely intervention in all kinds of internal situations have actually made a difference. So I think there has been a very significant adaptation uh, of the UN to these, these new circumstances. When I asked the question, what do the new uh, powers want? Uh, I'm, I would be very surprised if we went back uh, to the, the Cold War era uh, where any country could do whatever it wanted with its own citizen and nobody would react. I think we, we are well uh, past that uh, and even the countries that have never been very comfortable with the R2P concept, for instance, I doubt that they would argue that we should just 
stay off. I think there's, there's a new baseline that has been established um, uh, that will, uh, that will be, uh, continue to be in evidence in the UN. Do you think the member states are actually enthusiastic about R2P or is this really a non-state actor issue and they feel they have to move in this direction because of global public opinion? I think a great, man, a great number of member states are uh, in philosophically very much in agreement with R2P. The question is whether they're prepared to do what it takes to, <laughs> to implement R2P when it might entail some real cost to them. Uh, but the notion that there is a, a legitimate role for the international community to play in the protection of civilians uh, whose government cannot or will not protect, uh, I think that's a notion that is, uh, that is genuinely supported by a, a significant portion of the international community. There is another portion of the international community that really isn't keen at all uh, because they think it will apply to them one day and they don't want anybody to come and meddle with, you know, with their own internal situation. But that's when I say I don't think there will be a total slide back. I think there are, there are some new norms that have that have taken root, that are not easy to implement, uh, but uh, are there to stay, uh, if only because of the, of the ease of communications. Now, anything that happened in any country will be on your, on your uh, TV set. I think it, that very fact of the communications revolution did help to bring about these new norms. So I don't think we're going to, to, to slide back uh, completely, but nor are we likely to be as, um, to see a UN um, being as activistic as it was in the early 90s, where there was a lot of enthusiasm and not a lot of experience. Right, a lot of words and not quite as much action. Well, there was a lot of action, but then they discovered that it was a lot tougher than they thought. Right. But at least there has been traction on human security and there has yes. been traction on R2P. Yeah. What about global inequality? Surprisingly little traction on that file? Well, uh, I would say that if you, if you sit inside the UN, you, you would think that most of the UN is about, human, uh, about inequalities. All the, the development and humanitarian programs of the UN uh, revolve around the question of, of inequalities, or at least of raising the standard of living uh, of, of the poorest. Uh, the, the, the efforts of all the UN funds and program is about the poorest, about raising their own standard of living. If at the same time there's also, <laughs> there's also some inequality that creeps in, that's also part of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the preoccupation. Uh, so, and the UN, if you're a developing country, you know the UN very well because it's there in, with education, with health, what, you know what, it, what it's about, and they would say it is about, about inequality, and it is about poverty, and it is about, they know a lot more about that UN than they know about the UN of peacekeeping or the UN right. of, uh, of human rights, in a sense. But yet the UN isn't the forum for trying to open up global agricultural markets, for example, or to you know, regulate financial flows so that the international economy, the global economy doesn't sideswipe vulnerable countries as easily as it's done in recent years. Well, so, so the big ticket structural issues really still aren't within the UN's. Well, one, would, one could argue that they're all part of the UN family. Everyone is, of course, yes. And, and it is. I mean, the, the, the political UN, um, headed by the Secretary General, uh, is the head of the series of entities that form the UN system. We met twice a year uh, with the heads of all the agencies, funds and programs for the purposes of coordination, harmonization of policies to the extent that the secretariats do, and the, the, the IMF, the World Bank, and, and the, the um, World Trade Organization were represented by their, their, their chief. So there's, in a sense, the dream of diplomats who live in, in New York would be that they dictate the overall shape of economic policy. Uh, but unfortunately, the, 
the political UN is not the equivalent of the cabinet of a national government. It is, it is in a sense owned by the foreign ministry. And that explains to some extent it, the difficulty that the central UN has in, um, in, uh, in, in being truly in the lead of the entire system. Very good. Well, we'll be back again once more with Madame Louise Frechette. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. You can find us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Louise, I'd like to come back to an issue you raised right at the very beginning, which was your appointment at a high level of the UN as a woman. As we both know, global governance, such as there has been global governance, was always very male, very white male. Not quite as white now, but still very male, right? Uh, tell us a bit about your experience as a woman, the reaction to your appointment as a woman, and, and a bit about the obstacles women face in, in getting into senior positions. Um, when I was named to the post of Deputy Secretary General, the news in Canada was Canadian named to the post. Everywhere else in the world, the headline was woman named to the num this new number two post. Because in Canada, it had stopped, in a sense, being a novelty, because we had had women uh, already in the most senior posts of the nation. You know, the clerk of the Privy Council, when I was there, was a woman. The, the chief justice of the Supreme Court is a woman. We've seen women in almost every possible capacity in Canada, not true in the rest of the world. Did it make a difference uh, in terms of my capacity to act in the UN? No. Not at all. Partly because by then it didn't bother me to be a novelty or to be as part of a minority. I came with 30 years experience. I was well known in the place. I didn't feel that being a woman made one iota of a difference to my ability to do my job. And I had a small group of wonderful colleagues. Uh, at the head of uh, UNICEF and the, and the, the and WHO and the World Food Program and, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I wasn't the only senior woman. What I did realize, however, was that the fact that I was a woman was immensely comforting for the women in the secretariat, the more junior women. For them, it was really encouraging to see a woman at the top of the organization. Uh, and, it, and I came late to the realization of how important it was um, to, um, uh, to the self-confidence of women in, uh, in the secretariat, and I suppose also in the diplomatic representations of many countries. By now you have most countries of the world, even the ones you think would have no women, have women in their diplomatic corps, and they have women in their, in their diplomatic representation to the UN, but they tend to be more junior. So to have, uh, to have a senior woman is, is not insignificant. And I must admit I had not fully appreciated that at first. And do you encourage young women to get involved in the UN system? Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, in the UN system and in, 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 in international relations and in, in uh, in uh, foreign affairs, absolutely. Uh, there was a time where um, being a woman was a, a bit of a problem in, in personal terms. Uh, if you wanted to have children, how would you be able to reconcile your obligations to take postings, to move around? And you had a spouse who probably thought his career was more important than yours. That was, that was a challenge at the time. Not I think this is changing fast. I think this has changed. Uh, certainly in, in, in the UN Secretariat, uh, there were many women uh, and they, most of them were married, most of them had children and somehow the system, and they have you know, maternity leave and all of, all of that. And somehow they found ways to accommodate uh, pri their private, private life and their professional life, uh, whether women end up having busier days than men, that could well be still the case. But whether it is possible to, uh, to thrive in, the, in, a, in an international career as a woman, I think so. Do you think we'll see a, a woman secretary general anytime soon? I would hope so. <laughs> I would hope so, but at the same time, I would be the last person to suggest 
uh, that this be the, pro the primary criterion. Uh, in fact, being the Secretary General of the UN is one of the most challenging jobs on earth. Um, uh, it takes an exceptional person and we really should look for the best person possible to run for that job. And I wish we could do away with this notion that the part of the world that you come from uh, has to be uh, the deter you know, a, a determining factor uh, until your region has had its turn. Uh, go for the best person, and if it can be a woman, all the better. I hope so as well. Well, thank you very much, Louise, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with us. And thanks to everyone watching for joining us today on Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. See you again next week, I hope.